All right. So I'm a graduating senior, and I've been working with Dr. Wilson for the last most of a year on this. It's a pure math research project, and we're working on extending the sign of invariant. So I'm going to start with explaining what that is and what parts of mathematics it's related to and how these invariants come about, then I want to give a little bit of background on the original Simon invariant and the graphs on which it was done. After that, I'll talk about how we extended it, which assumptions were used, and what structure we used to do this, and then I want to show you the results for the graphs where it worked and the ones where it didn't. It didn't work on all of the ones we tried. After that, I want to take the one where it did work for the complete graph on 13 vertices and show how you can create an achiral embedding of this graph with every possible odd value of this invariance via whole family of embeddings. So let's begin with what in the world am I talking about? <laughs> Graphs in this context are, if you've taken graph theory, it's you've got vertices, they're connected by lines, it's like a molecule. And that is our basic object. But instead of working with them in an abstract sense, where you only care about what's connected to what, we're talking about embeddings. And an embedding is you make like you make it out of strings. You make it in the real 3D world where the lines can't just pass through each other. And that means that any one graph, there are an infinite number of ways that you can embed it because those lines can be all tangled up with each other. And we want to pull those apart. But it's really hard to work on a 3D object. So what we do is take projections of them, which is a two-dimensional picture. It's flat. But you can still see which lines are going over or under each other. And that's what the various variants are going to be defined on. And I want to mention this for later. When we come to achiral stuff, that just means it's the same as its mirror image. So just think of mirror worlds from Star Trek, and you'll be set. <laughs> so let's take projections and graph embeddings. Well, what's an invariant? Well, invariants are what we use to try to tell these different embeddings apart from each other. And these are values where, for a given embedding, if you move it around, take a flat picture of it, take a projection, and calculate the invariant value on that, no matter what projection you took, you should get the same value. That's why it's invariant, you get the same. So uh, what Breitmeister showed, and that was actually in the early 1900s that he did this, was that if you take just a small set of operations that you could do on one of these projections, you can get from any projection of graph embedding to any other projection of graph embedding, just by doing these over and over. So if we want to check that something is invariant, all we have to do is check that none of these moves will change it. We don't have to check every single way that you can move everything. We just have to check these. This is great. This really simplifies the problem. So you'll see there are two different types here. And there's a reason why I put for embeddings of graphs. Because the original Reitemeister moves, this comes from knot theory. And these three apply to any old knot which is just, you know, a tangle of string in a loop. So those don't have anything to do with vertices. But when you start working with graph embeddings, you have to add these other two over here to handle the things you can do involved with vertices. You have to have one for what if you just twist it up right at the same vertex. So that's going to be right advice to move four. And you have to have one for what if you took an edge and you moved it over a vertex. You just pull it over the top. So that's going to be right advice from five. And we have to, to create a new invariant for a particular graph, check that every one of these works. So the Simon invariant was um, originally defined only on a couple of graphs. And it's very recent, it's from 1990. It was defined on the complete graph of five vertices, which is basically just a pentagram with a star in it. And it defined on K33, which isn't terribly interesting for this case, because I'm only looking at the complete graphs. 
Now, a student at Pomona College, Will Fletcher, in 2012, he extended it to seven vertices. This was a lot of big progress because extending these invariants can get really complicated. It was a surprise that this could be extended to K7. So, um, here's the original, take K5, this is how you calculate the invariant, is you take the linking number like you would if it were just a knot, but to every term that you would do in calculating the linking number, you add this little component here, you multiply it by a coefficient depending on where the edges are from. So you're going to have this whole graph is split into the outer part and the inner part, which I'm calling 0 and 1. And depending on where those edges came from that crossed, when you take the sum over all of the crosses, you're going to use a different value there. And this is what allows it to be an invariant for a graph embedding instead of for a knot. But those values have to work out with all those right amounts terms. So I wanted to show you what we decided we have to do to this in order to make it work on a bigger graph. And then, how do you make those equations to make it work on the right amount of terms? So, why keep the same structure? I still want it to be like it's in stars. So you go around the star, all those edges, they're going to be kind of the same. It's going to be one category of edges. And because this is a complete graph, so all the vertices are connected, all the other vertices, I don't want to have to say, this vertex is different. No, we're going to say all the vertices are equivalent. <coughs> you only need a set of equations for one vertex, and you only need the epsilon values to depend on which stars the various edges <coughs> were coming from. This makes it harder, because the more epsilon values you have, the more variables you have, the more degrees of freedom, the easier it is to make it invariant. By limiting this way, we're making it harder. And you also have that the values cannot depend on which edges which. It's symmetric. It's just where do the edges come from that are cross edges. So let's see what we can do with the right amount terms under these restrictions. The first three aren't too bad. Remember, the linking number was part of the Simon invariant. The linking number handles the first three right amount moves for us. We don't have to even look at them. Okay, simplify the problem. Good. Right amount move four. This is the one where you have two edges are just twisted at the vertex. This tells you that if the edges are adjacent coming into the same vertex and they cross each other, the epsilon value must be zero because doing that and undoing it must not change the value of the invariant. But it would if you just used like it. So we know those epsilon values are zero. Then, we look at right amount of move five. Remember, this is where you have all this stuff coming out, into and out of a vertex, and you're pulling one edge over. This creates a system of linear equations. Every edge that you could possibly loop over, you've got a whole new linear equation for every one that has a term for every one of those places it crosses. Those form this system of equations. This is just for K7. This is for seven vertices. I couldn't use K13 for this example because the equations wouldn't fit on the slide. There are too many of them. So every one of these edges here, I loop it up and around over that vertex, and it gives me a system of equations there where every place it crosses one of these creates a term here. So one edge here, one equation there. It looks really nasty at this point. All these zeros, these are where the ed end of this met the beginning of the line that you were looping over. So those zeros are caused by the right of Meister 4 moves. The great thing is, you've got symmetry here. What goes out looks a lot like what comes in. So a lot of this cancels out. Those match each other. We don't need them. Cancels out of the equations. Great. Now they've all got only two terms. <laughs> it just got a lot easier. But we also know that like 0, 1 is the same thing as 1, 0. It doesn't matter what order that we're considering them in. So simplify that, take out the redundant equations, down to just 6. That looks a lot more solvable. 
Now, at this point, when you're working with K13, you're down to like 33 equations. But too many to show. Let's stick with K7. There's a solution for K7. This is the one that was done in 2012. And you can see you just get ones and minus ones. Nice, simple values to work with in the end. OK. So now that we see how to construct the equations, what did I do? I took every prime number from 11 to 127. And I did that. I did the first few by hand, went up to 23 by hand. And then I said, no, this is too much work. I made a MATLAB program to do it for me. But at first I thought, every prime number is going to work, surely. I mean, don't primes always work? Not this time. K11 found a contradiction. I thought, oh, surely that'll be the only one that doesn't work. K13, it worked. Okay, good, good. 17, 19, 23. Contradictions all the way as far as I've gone. So far, the only one other than the original ones with five or seven vertices that works is 13 vertices. And here are the epsilon values that I ended up with for 13 vertices. So it matches all the equations for satisfying the right of Meister moves. It's an invariant. Hurrah. But why? <laughs> why does this one work? Why don't the other ones work? So that's my open question at this point, is why would just these numbers work and not everything else? I have no idea. So now that we have a invariant, this was an idea that was sent to me by Dr. Floppin over at Pomona College, which is, you can use these to show things about the chirality of the various graphs. So let's see, K13 has an achiral bedding. Can we make one with every possible odd number as the value of this extended Simon invariant? So I guess we can. So this is the achiral embedding that we started with. And this is going to take a minute because it's really kind of complicated. These are layers that are stacked on top of each other. So it's kind of built up, and this one that's different from the others is in the center. Then, you know, this one is a quarter turn different from that one. This one's a quarter turn different from that one, and so on. So the way you show it's a chiral is that if you took its mirror image, you could just turn it a quarter turn, and it would look like itself again. So we're starting with this one, and then going to show that the value on this is odd. Well, I have a symmetry argument for avoiding counting all the crossings in the projection, but that gets a little bit complicated. So I also just drew them out, counted them. If you smash that whole thing into a projection and then you sort of twist each a little bit so that the, you don't have a bunch of crossings on top of each other, so you can actually count every individual one, there are 645 of them. Which doesn't really matter, except that it's an odd number. And when you look at these layers, in each layer, you, you only have straight lines. So you never have adjacent edges crossing each other, which means there are 645 terms in that sum. And because all of the epsilon values are odd, every one of those terms is odd. So we've got a sum of an odd number of odd numbers. It's odd. Thankfully, that's all we need to know about it. I'm glad I didn't have to actually calculate the value. Then, once you know it's odd, how do you get every other odd number out of it? I got really lucky at this point. Um, Ryo Nikuni in uh, Japan came up with this structure for K5, for the five vertex graph, where they can create every odd value on it with the sign invariant. And not disturb the chirality. And I noticed that if you take just the outermost layer of this large ball of crossings, then you can take a subgraph that is K5 out from this big K13. All you do is you take the center vertex, and then you take four on the edges so that you have the same structure. Then 
you can take these edges and pull them over, make these little areas in which you can twist them up. And twist them up there as many times one way or the other as you want. And at the same time, take the two that are going all the way across and switch which one's on top. By doing this, when you twist them, you change the invariant value by four for each twist. So you can get half of the odd numbers that way. Then, when you switch this one right here, it changes it by two. So you get the other half of the odd numbers. And by doing this on the subgraph, since the Simon invariant is just a sum, you can sort of shift those terms over that have to do with the subgraph and alter those without altering the whole rest of the invariant. So this construction actually applies to being able to get a value for each of these for the extended Simon invariant on K13. And that means that we can create embedding with and for the coming. So in conclusion, we created a new invariant for this particular graph by extending the Simon invariant. It allows us to tell the difference between certain embeddings. And you can see that because this whole family of a chiral embeddings, every one of them has a different delta invariant. And this worked for 13, but mysteriously, that's the only prime number so far we've found that it's worked for other than the original two. That's an interesting area for continuing. And we have this family of chiral embeddings. But more importantly, perhaps from this conference's perspective, I started this during my junior year. I didn't start this knowing a lot of mathematics. I hadn't even taken graph theory yet. As undergraduates, we can extend ourselves into these research spaces successfully. I mean, you don't have to start with something where you already know what's going on. You'll find out. You'll find out. And that is a lot more powerful than just reading something for a textbook. So to be able to not only understand their papers, but then go in and create something new, that's within our reach. I think that's the most fantastic part of the experience. So I would like to thank Dr. Robin Wilson because he has been a huge help in this. He gave me the original idea. I walked into his office and said, hey, I need research. I need to do research. I don't know anything. And he handed me a paper and said, come up with something. Started this whole thing off, so I'm very pleased with that. And he's helped me immensely in the process. And I want to thank Dr. Erica Flappin at Pomona College because she has had some incredible suggestions like looking into the achirality, and several of her papers, the explanations in them, have helped with understanding the material far more than they needed to. I mean, she could have explained less, and she didn't. So I've been very, very pleased with that. If you are interested in knot theory, graph theory, low dimensional topology is what was sometimes involved with, then these papers are very helpful for getting started. So thank you. We have time for maybe just one quick question, if anyone has one. Sam? Um, you said you didn't know exactly, but do you have like a hunch why K13 only works and none of the other works? I actually don't even have a hunch at this point. This is super mysterious to me. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to find, can I make like a space out of the equations and see how the equations transform without going back to the graphs. I'm hoping to find a pattern there, but actually, come on over with start getting these up while we ask. Any, any other questions? I have one quick one. Uh, my quick question is: Do you have plans to actually write this up and publish it somewhere? Yes. It sounds, yes, it yes, sounds yes. like this is totally publishable. We are working on writing an article. Perfect. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. Any other questions? How did you tell the verse? The verse with the epsilon and zero zero and zero one. It's Okay, so number them, arrange them in a circle, use that to create Hamiltonian cycles so like, based on how many vertices are skipped around the edges. And it was like epsilon one zero, was that two or one? Yeah, epsilon one zero would be if you had one that going around the edge didn't skip any vertices and you had one that skipped 
one vertex, and they were